Markets had a solid day here on Thursday as President Biden announced an infrastructure plan that seemed to uh, boost a lot of those cyclical stocks that had been struggling here more recently, which allowed the Dow Jones Industrial Average to actually lead over the S&P 500 and NASDAQ composite today. Uh, that was enough actually to switch the Dow Jones Industrial Average posture back to weekly bullish and kind of joined uh, all of the other indices with their bullish posture at this point. So we'll take a look at all of that, uh, see what it means uh, from a broader perspective. Then we'll start drilling down into some of the various areas with in the market where I wanted to focus on a bullish strategy known as a sold put where there's a stock that I uh, have a fairly high opinion of from a long-term dividend investing perspective where maybe we could try to get an even further discount for our money by selling a put upon it to generate some income up front. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It is June 24th, 2021. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube and click subscribe on our channel. While you're over there, make sure you check out our description area down below and sign up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at, uh, at Brandon Van Zee, and we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related tweets. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at the web address embedded in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's activity. And as you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. And while we didn't really have uh, the S&P 500 up 1% to make it a, a really strong day, um, it felt to me stronger than what the indexes would suggest. I saw a lot of stocks breaking out today or at least having really strong bounces. So uh, to me, it feels like the 0.58% on the S&P 500 kind of undersold uh, the true strength of the market here today. Even still, you can see that it was enough to put in a new all-time high on the S&P 500 uh, from both a closing basis and an intraday basis. And we are now up and over that prior resistance uh, from back here in mid-June. So good strong bounce up and off of that rising moving average there. And as I mentioned to you guys on Tuesday, no surprise that we've now switched back to a strongly bullish posture. Uh, figured that would happen. Uh, and uh, indeed that is the case. Now, um, what is a little bit more surprising is what's taking place over here on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This chart felt a lot heavier to me in recent days, and the fact that it was able to boost itself all the way up to this moving average and also change its posture from strongly bearish to weekly bullish is rather impressive. Remember, that crossover or that uh, color change takes place when you have this green intermediate line trending lower to give us that bearish posture, and then when it starts pulling itself back up like it did here more recently, as long as it's out of that upper, our lower reversal zone, so in this case, it's kind of in that neutral white zone there. If it starts rising like it just did, that means we now have that weekly bullish posture. But having said that, uh, I'm still not a huge fan of the chart. You know, it can change, and that's, of course, the nature of the markets. They do change, uh, which is why we look at these uh, videos and, and record these videos as often as we as we do. Um, but right now, I'd, I'd still be a little bit hesitant just knowing that we're still trading below that falling 30-day moving average there. And that does make the Dow different than these other four markets that we see, or these other three markets that we see on the board here in front of us. So good sign there. Uh, and like I mentioned in the intro, a lot of that outperformance from the Dow today could be as a result of some of those stocks like Caterpillar and others that had struggled in the last few weeks, kind of getting a little bit of a boost today after the infrastructure uh, plan was announced. On the bottom set of charts here, uh, we've got good vibrations there as well. We've got uh, the NASDAQ composite uh, still uh, carrying forward with its momentum. We now have another all-time high for the NASDAQ composite. Remember, that was an achievement earlier this week when I was with you on Tuesday, and it gave us this overbought cluster signal. And I said, this was an overbought cluster signal that you could actually identify as a bullish uh, signal because it was early on in the in the process there, right? It made the NASDAQ a little bit different than some of these other indices that we've been looking at. So uh, we broke out above that prior resistance area from late uh, uh, April, and we have continued to, to coast since then. Now, the moves the last couple of days, maybe not as strong as what we saw the first couple of days, but you know, let's be honest, this is four straight days to the upside for uh, the NASDAQ composite. That is a robust move there. 
Um, and uh, you know that's an area that we want to be focusing our attention on as trend traders. In particular, a lot of the technology stocks have really started to come to life here recently. We talked about those software stocks in Tuesday's presentation, and they've continued to, to go a bit higher. Now, we didn't close at the highs of the session. Nonetheless, another advance there, a very promising sign as we're now starting to establish kind of a new trading range above that prior resistance area. The Russell 2000 had something new to discuss today. We now went back to a strongly bullish posture on the Russell 2000. Now note the difference between the Russell 2000 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Both of them saw a posture shift today, but they were uh, really representing the four different color possibilities. Uh, with the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, we went from dark pink to light green, in other words, strongly bearish to weakly bullish. The Russell 2000 was not suffering nearly as much as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so it never did go to the dark pink color. It only went to the light pink color. In other words, we had a weekly bearish posture that with today's surge now has pushed us back to a strongly bullish posture. You can see down below that green line has wrapped itself higher once again. And the reason that the color is different is notice where that green line is placed within this lower indicator. That green line is above the 50th percentile and wrapping itself higher, whereas with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's below the 50th percentile and wrapping itself higher. So that's what's dictating the difference in the language between weakly bullish versus strongly bullish. And I, would, I think most of us would concur uh, that when we look at this chart, it does appear that the Russell 2000 is stronger than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. As mentioned before, a little bit of fear there, knowing that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is now contending with that resistance, whereas this was not an issue for the Russell 2000. You had one day where it closed below the moving average. The very next day, it popped right back above it and has been coasting since then. Looks like there's a decent chance we could get the Russell 2000 to break out to an all-time high, perhaps as soon as tomorrow. Now, remember, tomorrow could very well be a big volume day. Tomorrow is the annual uh, Russell rebalancing for all the various Russell indices, including the Russell 2000. We spent a long time talking about that in my question and answer session earlier today, as a matter of fact. So tomorrow you should expect heavier volume, especially in the names that are involved in the um, in the portfolio turnover. Remember, some stocks will be graduating from the Russell 2000 and going into the Russell 1000. Some will be heading the other direction. Some will be falling off the list completely. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of uh, kind of transitioning within the markets tomorrow. So just be brace yourself for that possibility. Uh, we could have some uh, erratic movements, particularly right within the last, let's call it, minute or two of trading with some of the less liquid securities that are out there. So be on the look for look out for that. But all in all, I think today was a very, very positive day. Russell 2000 up 1.31%. So um, that bearish trade that I had done on the Russell 2000 that ended on this candle, couldn't have timed it more perfectly. Basically went down there, allowed us to take max gain. And once we got out of the trade over the weekend when uh, they took those June uh, contracts out of our account, it's been off to the races for four straight days, similar to what we've seen there uh, with the NASDAQ. So uh, really good sign there coming from the Russell 2000. So as we look at this, it kind of appears to me that the NASDAQ continues to be the leader of this market. S&P 500 probably in second place as it hit a new all-time high today. Russell uh, 2000 is in third place. And then um, Dow Jones Industrial Average probably pulling up the rear there. But it's great to see that at last we have uh, green across the board once again in terms of a posture perspective according to the market forecast technical indicator. Let's go ahead and take a look now at our next chart. This, this will be our three green arrows chart here. And as you can see, we've got the three green arrow signal uh, alive and well on both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite. Again, those are our two strongest uh, indices at this moment in time from my perspective. Uh, and so it's no surprise that those are also the two that have the three green arrow signals. Over here on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Russell 2000, the good news is neither one of them have three red arrows, um, but there's a mix of green and red arrows. And that's why the background colors are white there. In the case of uh, both of them, it appears that um, the only one that they're missing is the green arrow on the MACD histogram. Well, actually, I take that back. Um, we don't have a green arrow on the Dow Jones uh, moving average yet either because it did close slightly below that moving average. But um, point is, if we have a big update tomorrow, it is possible.
possible that we might end up having all four of these charts with a three green arrows signal. It would have to be a pretty big up day uh, because we do have a little bit of um, room for the MACD to get above the zero line on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But if we have just a small up day tomorrow, uh, I do think you have a good chance at seeing uh, the Russell 2000 going to three green arrows as soon as tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that possibility. Let's go ahead and now take a look at our 1040 crossover method. And so this will be chart 4C for those of you that are premium members uh, following along at home. Uh, also a quick friendly reminder that uh, we do have uh, one week left for those of you that uh, were our original 2018 members. If you have not done your uh, renewal yet for the upcoming three years, there's one week left for you to get uh, the last remaining discount there. So uh, if you should have been receiving plenty of emails from us uh, over the last six months about it. So we don't want to uh, go overboard with that. But just in case you happen to put it to the side and kept saying to yourself, well, I'll get to it later. We'll just make sure you get to it within the next uh, week here. Fortunately, many of you have already done that. And so we're good to go for another three years. And David and I will be looking forward to serving all of you premium members there. But uh, a reminder that the premium members are the ones that get access to the 50 plus thinkorswim charts that we show you during these presentations and during all of David and I's uh, premium trading rooms that we teach you during the day. And so uh, this particular chart is 4C. The difference of this chart compared to the first couple that we've looked at so far is that this one will take us further back in time. Each one of these charts is uh, three years in length and each one of the candles represents a whole week. And what we're looking for here are, are moving average crossovers. Sometimes you might hear us refer to the idea of a golden cross uh, or a death cross. And uh, we're in golden cross territory uh, in all four of our charts. Not a surprise there for those of you that have been tuning into these videos for a while because um, you know we've had golden cross uh, for basically the last entire year. Remember, these are charts that you will not see a lot of trade signals from. They are infrequent. They're not there to try to time the exact top or time the exact bottom. They are there to try to get the most of the move in between. Now, if you have choppy markets, it's not always uh, easy to make money off of a moving average crossover system. But if you have trending markets, it is much easier. So of these four charts here, you can see that the Russell 2000 over the last three years has probably been the one where it's been the most difficult to make money off of a crossover method because you have seen so many flip flops in that moving average. Whereas these other charts, it's been more consistent to the upside where had you gone bullish at the time of the crossover, uh, you probably would have uh, been able to extract some pretty decent profits out of the market along the way. So um, nothing really new to report uh, from that perspective. I will say that with, to, with this week's move, we are seeing a little bit of an improvement on one count. And that is, if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the Russell 2000, notice how we have these little green arrows that are showing up. Now what that's signifying is that price closed back up above that orange line, which happens to be the 10 week moving average. So that's not the signal we're looking for, right? We're looking for the signals of the moving averages crossing, but those arrows are kind of like an early indicator of a possible uh, shift in that moving average. And so we did have a little bit of pressure with that red arrow coming in last week on the Dow Jones Industrial Average as price did close slightly below uh, the, the, the orange line, the 10 week moving average. And the same thing happened here with the uh, Russell 2000. So it's good to see a little bit of spring in the step of this market to pop right back above that 30, I'm sorry, the uh, 10 week moving average in this case, uh, the very next week. Remember, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to kind of get back on track, but uh, good to see us so far with one day left, uh, looking like we're showing a little bit more resilience, bullish resilience within the marketplace right now. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the uh, internet briefly. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support this project. As I mentioned to you uh, regularly, as long as I'm getting 100 likes on Twitter, I feel like it's worth my time to do the video. Uh, if I'm getting less than 100 likes, then uh, I don't really feel like it's necessarily worth my time. Um, and so we got exactly 100 here today. So great job uh, for the, those of you that did that even last minute. Uh, if you were to do that there uh, just a few minutes before I got uh, started here, it did, it did mean something. So sometimes people wonder, or, well, does my like mean anything? Well, yeah, it does. It got, got us to 100 this time. Um, as I mentioned before, 
you know, David and I have the uh, the good luxury to, of being able to do what we love in life, which is teach. Uh, we don't need to do a, a, a teaching session for free uh, every day the way that we do here because we have plenty of opportunity to do that for uh, our premium members throughout the day. In fact, earlier today, I taught what I think is probably a record length class for me, uh, which was over three and a half hours long of doing nothing but answering my premium members' questions out there. And so uh, if you missed the class, feel free to check that out. I do have the recording posted for those of you that are premium members. Uh, we had a, a long conversation about the Russell indices and their rebalancing and what it means with the MAME stocks and the SPAC stocks and what that can mean for options falling in and out of the money, what sort of um, you know wacky price behavior should we be expecting, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, then we had a, a question about analyzing Nexstar's business model as a dividend growth investing candidate. Found a lot of really intriguing fundamental analysis on that lesser known uh, media company there. Uh, we also had a long conversation about Roth 401ks. That was really in the news today uh, with uh, Peter Thiel and, and others uh, and how they are taking advantage of the Roth IRA and uh, kind of giving my insight as far as where would I prioritize uh, contributing to a Roth versus something like a traditional IRA or in some cases perhaps even thinking about looking at maybe an HSA, a health savings account or uh, taxable accounts or uh, other um, Coverdale um, uh, education accounts. So we had a, a long conversation about IRAs and how to kind of think about them for people who are in different stages of life. Uh, we then also looked at uh, Xerox from a value line perspective here today. We also had a conversation about rebalancing. Uh, had a student here that lives entirely off of his dividend stream, and he's done a great job. So hello to you, Phil, and keep up the great work on your end there. Uh, he lives entirely in retirement off of his dividend stream, and uh, he has successfully built his dividend portfolio with me over the last six years and done a remarkable job with that. But he has noticed some uh, skew uh, in the sectors from when he first started to where he's at right now. So he's wondering, does, you know, does rebalancing make sense? Uh, for a dividend growth investor as opposed to other types of investors out there. So I share my thoughts with them and it might be a bit unconventional uh, compared to the way that most people would answer that question. So feel free to check that out if you're intrigued. Uh, we also had a question about um, what controls the, the price action of the ETF. And we uh, learned about authorized participants and the uh, mechanism that allows for arbitraging of the ETFs themselves and how that benefits us as individual investors out there. We also had a question about XL Energy, uh, one of my old stomping grounds in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, that's the utility company up there. So we reviewed that from uh, a fundamental analysis perspective. And then we discussed the CCC spreadsheet and how it might look different to some of you depending on where you're retrieving that information these days. So lots of great content there. Again, it was an over three and a half hours by the time it was all said and done. And so uh, feel free to check that out. So in other words, uh, you know, we don't need to, to put in another two or three hours producing these free videos on uh, YouTube merely to scratch the itch of teaching. We get a chance to scratch the itch of teaching all day long. So if you guys wanna keep these free videos coming your way on YouTube, we ask one and only one thing out of you. Just simply click like for us there uh, on Twitter, right? We do these videos for both promotional reasons and for educational reasons. If we can educate you for free and you can help promote us, then we have a symbiotic relationship that'll help ensure that these videos get done as often as possible in the future. If you guys don't wanna support us on that endeavor, then of course we can find other things to do with our time as well as busy uh, business owners that David and I are. So we really appreciate those of you that do help us along with that. Um, in terms of uh, some of the, the content here on our website, I did produce the Factor Selector uh, here a couple of days back wanted to share um, some of the uh, results there with you. And you can see that we've had a little bit of a shakeup in the one month category, which is what this is uh, sorted by here on the graphic. You can see that we have this green color kind of making its way to the top, and that's a bit different. Those are our momentum factor ETFs that we're tracking for this project. Now, not all of you attend that Wednesday morning class of mine, but I will tell you that for the last several months, it's been more regular to see the green um, uh, ETFs or the green colors down here at the bottom and it's been more regular to see the blue value colors up at the top. So this past month 
has started to represent a little bit of a, of a sea change. Now, whether that holds or not is anybody's guess. But as I've been mentioning to you guys here in, in my classes and also in these presentations, you know, we saw some uh, instances of that here in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think a big part of it for me was when DocuSign really erupted higher on their earnings announcement a, a couple of weeks back. It just kind of felt like something changed within the marketplace where the market was willing to consider growth stocks once again. Uh, and today was another case in point of that. Some of you saw me tweeting about those CRISPR stocks again. Uh, those of you that uh, watched this presentation a week or two ago know that I took that speculative long call trade on Editas. That stock was up like 8% today, as, as were a lot of the other CRISPR stocks. So it seems like the market is willing to take on risk once again and is pushing into some of those favored names from last year and it does seem like that has kind of helped support that rise in the nasdaq composite above some of those other broad indices that we've seen uh, here recently so uh, just when you thought the momentum stocks were dying on the vine they're coming back in a big way here all of a sudden and i think that makes things a little bit more exciting you usually get a lot more oomph out of those momentum and growth categories than you do out of the value areas. And so I, I for one, kind of like to see uh, a market being led by those momentum areas. So we'll see if that can continue uh, going forward or not. Let's go ahead and pop back on over here to the Thinkorswim platform. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look here at some 12 grid analysis, starting with chart 5A. So when we're looking at chart 5A, a reminder that this is our asset class 12 grid and the background colors of these uh, 12 grid charts will reflect whether we have a bullish or a bearish posture using the market forecast intermediate line. If the background colors of the charts are green, that means the current posture is bullish. If the background colors are pink, it means the current postures are bearish. So let's go ahead and see what we can discover from today's activity. One thing that stands out to me right away, which I, I guess I didn't notice earlier, I was busy today. I've got some family coming into town tonight that'll be staying with me for a few weeks. So uh, looking forward to, to kind of getting back to the uh, non-COVID uh, lifestyle once again, where we're not all hunkered down by ourselves. But uh, anyway, I happened to miss that gold was down a little bit today, uh, down enough to actually produce an oversold cluster signal. So that's kind of interesting all of a sudden. Um, gold is an area that I do have an interest in uh, for the longer term. Now, whether this is going to represent an opportunity in the shorter term or not remains anybody's guess. Right now, I'm not particularly liking the looks of the chart, but the fact that we do have that oversold cluster there is capturing my attention. It basically puts it back on my radar where I want to see if it can start carving out a bottom here uh, sometime soon. Now, remember, a lot of this breakdown in gold has been a result of this huge surge in the U.S. dollar that we've seen over here. So those two are uh, they're moving inversely uh, to one another right now, as they often do. And so um, right now, my assumption stays that the U.S. dollar will find a bottom before crossing below its moving average. And therefore, the opposite of that is that the uh, gold market will likely find resistance before crossing up and through its moving average. Now, before we get to that, we could have a nice little reversion to the mean type of a move based upon this oversold cluster signal. So it's just a matter of do you want to play it for the long term or the short term? I think you have an opportunity perhaps from the short term if you don't get your hopes up that you're going to all of a sudden go into some huge uptrend again. But I could see gold getting itself back up somewhat closer to that moving average. Um, we'll, 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 we'll be on the lookout for it. Um, one commodity that's surging regardless of what's happening with the U.S. dollar is oil. I mean, what a workhorse this thing is. It is absolutely just cooking to the upside. It was up once again here today despite gold being down. So uh, that's a fairly good sign there. Now, again, that is partially due to what we heard from President Biden in the infrastructure plan. Usually, uh, oil is a very industrial commodity, of course, uh, whereas gold is more of a monetary co uh, commodity. And so uh, more of the industrial commodities got a little boost from the prospects of perhaps building out some infrastructure in this country. So uh, good to see that because that is a risk on type of a mindset when we see that. Uh, we did see the 10-year uh, the treasury basically flat uh, here today. Didn't really go anywhere in either yield or or um, or price, but yields do remain in a downtrend. Somewhat interestingly, um, we do have long-term treasuries flip over here to the um, weekly bearish posture. Remember that was bullish. 
I'm not going to read too much into that because this is still a very strong trend that we've emerged from here. So my assumption is that it's going to continue to work its way higher until it doesn't. And at that time, we'll start finding um, you know, reasons not to like it or um, broken support levels or what have you. But right now, just be aware of that early warning sign that we have shifted to a weekly bearish posture after being bullish for quite some time. Um, so uh, we'll keep our eye on it. But right now, I don't think I'd be overly um, you know, suspicious of that move. Uh, I think it's probably going to hold above this moving average for a while. Um, one chart that I really like is this high yield bonds chart. I brought this up on Tuesday as well, and it's only continued to get better. Look at this breakout in high yield bonds today. Now, I've mentioned to you guys a lot, including Tuesday, that high yield bonds in this era are oftentimes associated with oil. And the reason for that is a lot of the energy stocks, oil and gas companies, issued high yield debt over the years as they were having a hard time um, getting lower cost debt because you know it just was not a great place to be operating in uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, when oil prices improve, it helps save the prospects of some of those small and mid-sized uh, oil companies and it starts improving the prospects of the bonds that they issued along the way that they're not going to default. So I think that's really helping high yield bonds here in addition to having the falling interest rate environment that we, we have here. Uh, Bitcoin was up today. Uh, but uh, still not enough to, to change the posture. Obviously, we're still trading below a falling moving average. It's been a, a really difficult time period for Bitcoin hodlers, as they're called, uh, or hodlers, however you say it, um, for the last couple of months after uh, topping out here back in, in April. It's been kind of a one-way street down. Today was a good bounce, so it's a start, right? We were up 5% or whatever it was, but um, got some work to do there, and uh, we'll see. I think it can do it because you know the one thing about Bitcoin is it is erratic. It can go all over the place in a hurry, so it could very well go above the moving average as soon as tomorrow, for all I know. It could also plunge another 10%. It's, it's very erratic. It's not for the faint of heart as we've said many, many times along the way. So right now, um, I would I would say uh, you got to be cautious if you're still below that moving average, but that could change very, very quickly. So something to keep on your radar there. Uh, preferred stocks also look pretty good, just like uh, high yield bonds do. Um, foreign emerging stocks had a really nice bounce, right? These are looking better all of a sudden than the foreign developed stocks. This was a flip-flop of sentiment over the last couple of months. It was, in fact, EFA, the foreign developed stocks that looked a lot better than EEM, the emerging markets, here about a month or two ago. Now I would say that it kind of looks like the, the baton has been passed, and you can actually see it through um, the, the percentages themselves. Notice how the EEM is now up 6.5% over the last three months, whereas EFA is only up 6.33%. And EFA has a dark pink background color, EEM has a dark green background color, and bouncing up and off of that moving average. So sometimes you do see uh, the emerging markets benefit, um, you know, when you have more of a risk on mindset. And it seemed like that was kind of the, the market's uh, MO here today. Uh, both of those, by the way, outperformed the S&P 500's 0.59% move. Let's go ahead and take a quick peek here at our sectors. And these are going to be the market cap weighted sectors, a reminder that these are the more popular ones, the XLFs and the like. Um, and so when we're looking at this, same thing, the green backgrounds are bullish and the red backgrounds or pink backgrounds are bearish. And um, you know, in terms of the charts that I think look the best are the same two that I mentioned on Tuesday. That continues to be the case. I like technology and communications in terms of how does their chart look? How does their trend look, right? Uh, it's a different conversation as opposed to, you know, where would you be looking for value opportunities? Uh, there you might very well be looking at utilities. Notice that utilities for the first time in over three months produced an oversold cluster signal here today. So you might very well be able to get a little bit of a bounce in the short term uh, out of the utilities. Where that goes from there is anybody's guess, but uh, you can see how that kind of acted as, a, uh, as an example to push a security higher with the materials back here on June 18th, you also had an oversold cluster signal and we have gone higher from there. So does that happen with the utilities going forward for the next week or so? I think it's entirely possible. Um, and that would be an area where maybe you could look for some, some value opportunities there. But if you're looking for trends, I do think that it is communications and technology where you want to be concentrating uh, your efforts, at least on a market cap weighted uh, basis. Both of those charts looking really good um, hitting new multi-month highs here as we speak. All right, let's get into our tra uh, trade application example for the day. 
I'm going to first bring up a chart 4A. And remember, the trade application is already done. Uh, I've already executed the trade and sent out all the trade details and screenshots and all of that to those of you that are our premium members. So one of the benefits our premium members get is access to our trade alert service. So that way, even if they're not in our classes, they're out running errands or what have you, they are getting updated by David and I's trades throughout the day for uh, these market outlook videos and also all of our premium trading rooms that we teach as well. So it's a good way for you guys, guys to stay plugged in to the classes that we're teaching. So the stock that I wanted to look at today is Amgen. Now, Amgen is a stock that I, I admire a lot. So admittedly, I come to this with maybe rose-colored glasses. You got to be careful uh, with that. Uh, I do like healthcare a lot. And in particular, within healthcare, I, I really do like Amgen. I think it has a bright future, uh, even though it's been a tremendously successful healthcare company for the last couple of decades. Remember, a couple of decades ago, it was a relatively unknown company uh, that was kind of in the emerging biotech space. Now, all of a sudden, fast forward to 2021, we find Amgen in the Dow Jones Industrial Average as a true blue chip company. Well, you can see here that Amgen did have a little bit of a pop here today. It did outperform the S&P slightly. It was up 0.94%, and that was enough to change our posture on Amgen. Yesterday, you can see the background color was pink, telling us that we had a bearish posture. Today, it flipped back to this light green, telling us that we have a weekly bullish posture. I know it's hard to see down below there, but that green line is now tilting higher just a little bit. Now, having said that, some of you are also recognizing that it got stuck right at a potential resistance area there. Notice that that moving average is falling and Amgen went up and through it for a brief period this morning and then kind of used it as an excuse to sell off. So while we still ended up with solid gains at the end of the day, it could have been a lot better had it closed at its highs. So we kind of have opposing thoughts there. On the one hand, we saw an outperforming stock here today with a posture shift back to bullish. On the other hand, we see that resistance still seems to be holding firm. So I don't want to get aggressive with my bullishness in a situation like this, which allows me to now bring up a second chart for you, which is a long-term chart. This will be chart 2A for those of you that are premium members. This is our dividend stair-step chart. And let me go ahead and pull up ticker symbol AMGN. And in this case, you can see that Amgen is trading in what we call the blue zone here. So you can see there's kind of an orange zone up at the top, a blue zone at the bottom. When a dividend stock is trading in that blue zone, what it's effectively saying is that its current dividend yield is attractive compared to that company's specific dividend yield history throughout time. So all else being equal, you would rather be a buyer in the blue zone as opposed to being a buyer in, let's say, the orange zone where you're a little bit overvalued. That's, of course, based upon purely the, the average high yield theory. There's a lot of other things that go into the pricing of stocks, but at least that's one core philosophy that I help my students uh, implement in my dividend growth investing classes on Tuesday mornings. So this one would be a qualifier for purchase. And remember, there's not a lot of them out there. There's, you know, uh, we're, we're in a market that literally hit all-time highs here today. So naturally, when stocks are at all-time highs collectively, the dividend yields are down. Well, Amgen's a rare case where its dividend yield is currently above average. It's got a yield of 2.92% right now. And I know that's not the highest yield on the planet, but for a biotech company, that's actually pretty reasonable. So what I opted to do for our trade application example today was to sell the August 220 put. And that would put our, uh, our cost basis down at around, let me see if I can get my mouse close to it, about right there. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of circling it with my mouse. In other words, what I'm doing here is I'm collecting over $200 up front from the market by selling a put. And I am then putting myself on the line for being willing to buy 100 shares of this stock if it falls an additional $21 per share, right? Because it's basically at $241 right now. So if the stock were to fall 21 more dollars per share between now and August expiration, I would then be on the hook to buy 100 shares. Now keep in mind, this is a pretty high priced stock, so that might be an impediment to some of you. But what will happen is that stock will then end up with a much higher dividend yield than it even has today. It will be a way higher than a 3% yield at that point if you were to lock it down at $220. Now if that doesn't happen, if this $241 stock either goes up it goes sideways 
or it even falls, it just doesn't fall $21 per share, then what will happen in that case is that you get to keep those $220 that you brought in today or whenever you place the trade um, of that credit. So you're assuming somebody else's risk. Somebody else is buying the put for protecting their own portfolio or perhaps speculating on a stock moving lower. You are the one selling it to them. You are acting as the insurance company there and you get to receive their premiums um, like you would send your premiums to Geico or Progressive or what have you. Somebody else is buying a put, you're the one selling it to them, they send you the premium, you're hoping they don't crash their car in the form of a stock, and the stock just kind of drifts either sideways or, or what have you, and then you get to keep that premium money to do whatever you want with going forward. And if in the worst case scenario, the stock falls, well, it's a stock that you like anyway, and that you have um, you know, a, a lot of respect for, and that you wanna own for the longer term at a higher dividend yield than where it is currently residing today, okay? So that is our trade application example for the day. If you got value out of today's video, please let me know by clicking the word like uh, on Twitter. Remember, there's four different ways that we make that available to you. You can either go directly to Twitter where we usually find it pinned to the top of the timeline or find it in um, the little embedded Twitter uh, area just directly below our video that you're watching on our website. Those of you that are watching directly on YouTube in the description area, you'll find a link that'll take you to that tweet. And then last but not least, those of you that are on our email distribution list, you'll find a uh, link to the tweet uh, within the email that you can just click on and then click like from there as well. So try to make it as easy as possible for you guys just to give up five whole seconds of your life to click like for us while we put together these videos for two or three hours for you for free. So if you like that uh, trade-off, go ahead and participate in that. If you don't, uh, that's fine as well. And we'll, we'll get that message. So uh, with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. David should be back with you tomorrow. Uh, and otherwise, enjoy your weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.